Welcome to Dream Makers, candid conversations with women that will change the way that you see success, purpose, and what it takes to bridge the two. I'm Neha Sampat, a three-time tech founder and CEO with a focus on companies that are places to dream big, build up, and be a good human. I'm CEO at Content Stack. This month is National Entrepreneurship Month, so we're doing something a little bit different. I've had the honor to interview some amazing women over the last year and a half, and I thought it'd be a great time to reflect on some of the knowledge that they shared. We're going back in time. We'll revisit some of our greatest hits on taking an entrepreneurial leap, successful founder qualities, and a lot more so that we may be able to be inspired to take that next step or make your dream a reality. Let's get started. We scoured our transcripts and the first thread that we uncovered was finding your purpose. I always like to think of myself as an early activist, and I think all the way back to my high school days or even earlier when I spent time in the afternoons after school working on a playground and trying to help kids that were typically kind of living on the streets or spending a lot of time just trying to figure out what path they were on. And I realized that I could have an impact on their lives. And I remember doing things like resume workshops or just helping people fill out job applications and just helping them to think about, you know, how to create a little bit of independence financially and thinking about how they could help their families so they could create an impact on the next generation. And I think about that as a combination of being able to just have access to opportunities or just access to knowing that there might be a different or better way and relatability, like knowing that you can look up to somebody who looks like you or things like you or has a similar background to you. And I think that was a thread that I've just carried with me on my whole journey. You know, I've always cared about finding talent in unusual places and applying that and providing opportunities where I could have an impact. Now let's listen to our dream makers talk about their purpose and how it translates to the companies and organizations that they founded. First is Brianne Asio, CEO of Seeker, a resource for travelers to find the best camping spots, read reviews, and connect with other adventurers. Brianne is an outdoor enthusiast who, along with her wife, decided to pack up and live life on the road in a van together six months out of the year. Here's Brianne on her purpose. My wife and I bought a van because we, we were both teachers and we had summers to travel. Right. So we bought a van, we started going around and, and we realized that people were constantly saying, you're living my dream. And part of me is like, heck yeah, that's, that's great. Like I have a cool life. But the other part is like, that is sad. Like I want more people to live their own dream. So being a dream maker, like helping other people achieve their dream was the impetus behind me becoming an entrepreneur. That is awesome to hear and amazing and right in line with what we expect dream makers to do. Next, Tracy Milligan is an exceptional entrepreneur who founded Term Payments, an online layaway solution to fund the Milligan Foundation, a relocation service for victims of domestic violence. This one is a heartbreaker with hope because Tracy is making a real difference. Let's listen. A person who had reached out for help to my organization and I had to tell no, two weeks later was a name in the paper. She had gotten murdered by her abuser. And whenever anyone calls for help or asks for help, I always do an assessment for what it would take to help them. And for her, it would have been $300. And I thought, $300 $300 and this woman would be alive right now if I had just had $300. And fundraising is not my superpower, not in any way, shape or form, but I have had successful businesses before in the past. And as the saying goes, before you can help someone else, you need to help yourself or put on the oxygen mask. You know, I can tell you on the airplane, put on your oxygen mask before you put the mask on anyone else or your child. And so it was like, okay, I need to come up with a business idea that's putting the mask on myself, that will provide me the financial resources to fund the Milligan Foundation so that I don't ever have to hear about someone dying because I didn't have money again, because I was absolutely devastated by that. 
Komal Dodlani is CEO and founder of lab for You, an organization that turns smartphones into labs to make science education more accessible for all. Here's Komal on her purpose. So today I'm on a mission to democratize science education and making it accessible to everyone, everywhere. I, I truly believe that talent is universal, but opportunities are not. So how can we find the next Einstein or Marie Curie that can be anywhere in the world? And today I'm strongly working towards this mission. I've made it my life mission through lab for you where I channelize my energy uh, to solve uh, a social problem in, in science education. And that makes you, in my opinion, a complete dream maker. Do you consider yourself a dream maker? I would say, I would say every curious scientist is a dream maker. Every student is a dream maker. Every entrepreneur is a dream maker. Every person that has a mission and that wants to solve a problem in society and humanity is a dream maker. Everyone who, who sees something and works towards it is a dream maker. So I would say maybe yes. Addy Schwartz is CEO of Reach Hire, which works with companies to on-ramp groups of women who left the workplace. But her work empowering women and girls started almost 30 years ago. You've had a very clear purpose throughout your career. All three of your companies focused on empowering women or girls. Talk to me about the moment that you knew that this is it and that this is what you were born to do. Well, it's been a journey. I have dedicated my career nearly 30 years, focused on empowering women and girls and created solutions for them. I think my first big aha moment was when I was on maternity leave with my first daughter. That's when really it came to the fore that there needed to be more options and more flexibility for women. The next entrepreneurial thread we uncovered was taking the leap. I've always known that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was inherent in me from when I was really young, and I've always kind of chased an entrepreneurial dream. Even when I was working in corporate jobs, I had a side hustle, and I always wished that one of them would turn into my next big thing. So when I decided to take the leap, it was rounding up to be my 30th birthday, and it was sort of a now or never situation. And I remember thinking, okay, if I don't start something now, it's never going to happen. And I'm going to look back and regret it. And I actually ended up landing a really cool job that I was excited about running e-commerce for a big company that was about to go public. So I went and did that to earn the paycheck. And my co-founder, which is my husband, left his job, which was our steady income job and started our first startup. And then I had to wait, which was really hard for me because I was helping out on nights and weekends and trying to help the business come along until I could also quit and join full time and we could both pursue our entrepreneurial journey together. And so I had to pay the mortgage and actually pay the first few payrolls of our employees that we had hired out of my paycheck. So it took a little while to get to the point of feeling comfortable financially to quit my steady paycheck corporate job so I could join the fun entrepreneurial journey that we were on. And I reminded myself on a daily basis with this large post-it note that I had taped to the back of my bedroom door. And every day when I left my bedroom to get into my car to commute to Palo Alto from San Francisco, I remember thinking, okay, I got to get to that number. I got to get to that number. Now let's hear from our dream makers. While Gayathri Rangachari is not technically an entrepreneur, she took a big pivot into journalism from financial consulting. And pivots look and feel a lot like big leaps. Let's hear from Gayathri. I mean, I think, look, it's hard and it's, you know, it's, it's, it can be scary and daunting, especially when you do really need that paycheck. But I think it's really important to love doing what you're doing. I think that kind of satisfaction, emotional satisfaction, I think nothing really beats it. And, you know, for me personally, I left high paying jobs to go work in a very low paying one. I was able to do that. I, you know, I, I realize how uh, fortunate I am that I could make that happen for myself. 
But, and for many people, that's not even a choice, right? You have to kind of do what you need to do in order to kind of get by. And people stay in jobs because of, you know, health insurance reasons and all of that. I know the reality of the United States, for example, uh, and frankly, even in India. But I think if you have the opportunity and you're able to take the risk without uh, impinging on your family's needs and your own personal needs, I say go for it. Try it out. At worst comes to worst, you know, it won't work. And then you can go back to doing the thing that, you know, was keeping you steady or, you know, whatever, stable. For sure. I mean, that's almost spoken like an entrepreneur. And that's the advice I often give when people are considering, you know, starting their own thing. I mean, you kind of just have to give it a shot and, and see what it does for you. The episode with my namesake, Neha Sampat, was meta. There's no other person I'd rather share a name with and be constantly confused with. She is CEO of Gen Lead Belong Lab and had a long and winding road through law and more to get there. She calls herself a reluctant entrepreneur. Let's hear from Neha and her leap. Yeah, it's so fascinating because when I tell people my story, they're like, whoa, that's like all over the place. And for me, it all makes complete sense because every next step built in some important way on the last one. But it is, I can see that it's curvy. So I started out practicing law. I went into... I out of law school, Bay Area, 2000, the first tech boom, IP law. I just kind of went with where the current took me. So I did that in big law. And then in that first year of practice, I was feeling misaligned. Mm -hmm. And that was not surprising to me because I always knew that my cause was, at the time, how I labeled it was education. Now I label it more broadly as empowerment. But at the time, I'm like, my cause is education. Like, I believe that by educating or empowering, as I call it now, that's how you actually impact change in the world. Like, you actually catalyze into change. And so I, I thought to myself, that's my cause. Someday, I'm going to do something in education. And very quickly in that first year of practicing law, I was like, wait a second. Why does someday have to be so far away? Like, no one said it has to be so far away. Why can't someday be today? And once I asked myself that question, I had no good response. There was no reason why it couldn't be today. Now, in retrospect, I know what was happening was that I wasn't growing at the pace I need to. Like growth is one of my values. And I was kind of stagnant to a certain degree. So that was the big driver for me. That was, I need to get moving. And it was also, I wanted to dig deeper on diversity, inclusion, uh, belonging. So I looked for some job. I'm like, this is the magical job I want. I'm 40 years old. I deserve what I want. I'm not going to like sacrifice. And there was no magical job that met all those requirements. And so I had no choice but to create that job. And that is how Gen Lead Belong Lab was born. Here's Tracy Milligan again. This time she has some important advice on taking the leap. Follow yourself. Don't listen to anybody. <laughs> Don't listen to anybody. Follow follow yourself because your dreams are yours and no one else is going to understand them. And people will try and talk you down or dissuade you simply because they don't understand or maybe they can't think that big for themselves. And so really follow your own heart, find people that align with what you want to do. I am a huge, huge, huge believer in mentors. And a lot of what I do, I couldn't have done without the introductions and me just, hey, how are you doing? I want to do this. And (laughs) would you mind helping me? Could I have a 15 minute phone call? You know, and but that's what I've done over and over and over and over again. And I mean, even back to when I was a kid, like I said, most of my education is uh, around medicine. And like I said, I was, I was one of those little kids that was hyper-focused on being a doctor. And I told our family physician, I wanted to be a doctor. And so every year he would give me a PDR, a physician's desk reference. So as soon as they'd issue a new one, he'd get the new one, he'd give me the old one. And I'd read it like it was a novel. And so I constantly put myself in positions to talk to people who were already where I wanted to be or doing what I already wanted to do and gain knowledge from them. And when when I would get to a point where I could actively help them or work with them, I would do it. Okay, 
We're on to our third overarching theme, which is founder qualities. What makes an entrepreneur successful? Are there commonalities or is each situation different or both? Yeah, there's a few things that I think are a common thread across most founders and entrepreneurs. Curiosity is a big one. And then knowing how to build and manage teams. So being able to attract talent, helping to grow that talent, giving them the ability to do really good work. Those are, to me, table stakes. I think one of the hardest things I've learned, and I'll tell you first through a story, is about resilience. I, about two years ago, was trying to learn how to sail in the San Francisco Bay. And if you know anything about sailing or about the bay, you'll know that it's one of the hardest places and worst places to learn how to sail. The water is polluted, it's shark infested, and it's really cold. And I find that the boat capsizes under my control. And I fall into the water, and I lose my shoes, and I lose my hat, and I'm hanging on to the boat and just trying to get back on and kind of panicked because that had never happened to me before. And it was really cold, and I wasn't sure if I was going to even make it. But my focus was on getting back on the boat. And so I got back on the boat. And this happened to me three more times that afternoon. And I learned that sometimes it's really just about getting back on the boat. Resilience is about becoming rejection proof, or in this case, being able to just crawl back up, pull yourself up and do it all over again. And that really, to me, resonates with entrepreneurship and the journey. It's every day, it could feel like you're getting pushed around and getting the boom hit into your head and falling into polluted waters. But really, it's about enjoying the highs when you actually catch the wind and you get a great sail and learning from the lows when you might fall down. Now let's hear from our dream makers. Melinda Garvey is the founder of On The Dot Woman, where she facilitates allyship so everyone can create their own path to success. Here, she talks about the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. There's a literary term that's called willing suspension of disbelief. Like if you watch a James Bond movie and you don't willingly suspend your disbelief, you're going to go, that couldn't happen. No way they have a car that does that. You wouldn't enjoy a bit of it, right? So I sort of look at it like (laughs) that. You have to, you have to set your expectations. So I know that being an entrepreneur means I will always be on the roller coaster. There will never be a time I can get off the roller coaster, period, end of report. There is, there is no exit. But what I can strive for is the kiddie coaster. So sometimes there are times when you know, you know, a little fun one that just makes your stomach go, blah, 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 and it's kind of fun, and you giggle, and you laugh. You know, you're not going ah, all the way down. So what I strive for, and I tell everybody, it's just like strive to be on the kiddie coaster some of the time. Cindy Padnos is founder and managing partner at Illuminate Ventures, a seed and early stage venture capital firm that invests in enterprise software companies. Here's what the queen of B2B had to say about the founders that she invests in. It's not just about survival. It's about the impact of being in a startup environment. Their day to day are peaks and valleys, almost every hour sometimes in one day you can have a peak and a valley. The customer that says no or doesn't renew and the award you get from Gartner Group, all happening in the same day, right? And and, and so resilience is about understanding how to sort of level that a little bit, particularly as it impacts your team, as it impacts others. It's one thing to have a little bit of that angst or whatever it might be inside your own system, But it's super important to demonstrate to the people you work with that the company is resilient, the technology platform you've built is resilient, the team you've built is resilient. Resilience isn't a a one person kind of a thing. It's really about building that into the entire ecosystem of your business. And it's really meaningful. In terms of what else we look for, you know, we tend to be a firm that is more interested in a founder who has deep domain knowledge, deep customer awareness versus one that is just about deep technology. Many of our companies have deep technology as as you do, 
but it's the added that's sort of to us, that's the necessary, but not sufficient ingredient. And so it's like a great wine. You can have great terroir, but if you don't have a great winemaker, it, it's not enough, right? Okay. So, you know, the platform is the terroir, but it's, it's the rest of the organization that has a real understanding and passion for the customer that we love to see. Achieving equity was another really big thread in our DreamMaker conversations, probably because of our very definition of DreamMakers. Not only do they work towards their dreams, but our DreamMakers also find ways to lift people and communities up. It's important to me. As an employer and also a business owner and just a person in leadership in the technology industry, I think it's super important to strive for a level playing field. And there's different ways to get there. One of the things I've always believed in is providing access where it might be difficult to find opportunities and then providing relatability. So someone who might be earlier in their career or an earlier stage entrepreneur that's looking for someone to look up to, being able to provide that relatability. And those are two things that always stand out to me when thinking about how do you extend the ladder down and pull people up. And then from a company standpoint, it's really just about understanding the impact that diversity, equity, and inclusion can actually have on the bottom line. And there's so many statistics that point to having a diverse board, diverse leadership, or having equity across your management team, even just representation of different backgrounds and cultures and genders and ages and experiences, all contributing to improving results inside an organization. It's proven over and over again. So from my perspective, extending the ladder down helps to lift everybody up. For the first DreamMakers episode ever, I spoke to Deborah Dahl and Sherry Hinnish, two supply chain entrepreneurs, about a simple way to be more equitable. So there's this mindset of there has to be another way. And, you know, another example is that Sherry and I have been showcasing a concept called a panel, which is an all-male panel. Don't uh, get me started. Is, I'm just going to briefly mention it. I've been calling mantles out today. We I have, called out five more. Yes. Mantles all, so day, all the time. All the problem. Day. Yes. We have these conferences, these days webinars that are all men. But here's the catch. The field is not all men. And so we think to ourselves, there's got to be another way, namely reflect the field that you're representing. Right. And so we ran some numbers and we've been calling out manuals virtually because they as you and I were talking about recently, there is no excuse right now. The world is literally open to you as guest speakers because everything has gone virtual. Any reason you previously had to not include a woman. And I recently had a, a post on or a response on LinkedIn that every supply chain professional and put anything in there, any science professional, any HR professional knows a female supply chain professional, all of them, 100%. So all you have to do is ask the man you were going to ask to be on the panel. Hey, do you know a woman with a great perspective? All you have to do is ask. <laughs> it seems so straightforward, but like level, leveling the playing field, it's a big passion of mine. Obviously the tech industry has a similar problem and I've been sitting on mammals as the only woman for, for years now. And I, all you have to do is ask, like, we just don't get asked. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. You know what, what else is crazy is I've had three responses in the past 24 hours where the conference organizer said, well, we asked a woman and she declined or, you know, scheduled. And I said, ask another one. <laughs> At you, you've asked one, you've checked the box for diversity, so you're off the hook. It's just unbelievable that people, if you truly want to have a representative sample of thought leadership, put in the work. Here's Addie Schwartz again, the CEO of Reach Hire, about why we need systemic change for women in the workforce. I think my just do it moment was sort of thrust on me. I don't think it was something that I created or designed. And that's what happens to all of us, right? That life happens and it's how we respond. So my daughter was injured in a car accident that I actually was the car driver in 
And I had to take a year out of the workforce to help my family recuperate. In fact, what happened was a couch fell off a truck on a major highway. And I ran into the couch going 65 miles an hour. So we got out of the car upside down. My younger daughter had a pretty serious head injury and needed to take a year out of school in order to recuperate. And so I went with her and helped her on her journey, took time out of my career in order to help her get back. And when I did that, I saw all the women that were sitting on the sidelines and I said, we need to do better on this. This is an invisible problem that we need to help women create an on-ramp for, and we need to do this in a way that's thoughtful, intentional, and systematic. And that's how Reach Hire was born. And Illuminate Ventures' Cindy Padnos adds the business why behind achieving equity. It's not just because it's the moral thing to do. It's actually the right move for business. Remember, this is coming from a venture capitalist. Without a doubt, it was harder for me to raise capital for my business than for most of the guys that that were out there raising capital at the same time. I just fundamentally believe that if we create a level playing field, if we open the door wider, we give the opportunity, not just to women, but also just all different types of diverse founders. We have multiple Latino founder CEOs. We have multiple LGBT founder CEOs. We have many women founder CEOs you know, in our portfolio. What you'll find is unique opportunities that outperform. And, and we're seeing that across all three of our funds today, our, our Spotlight Fund, Fund One, and Fund Two. Our best performing companies have diverse founding teams and have had the opportunity and the choice uh, have chosen, I should say, to build diverse teams around themselves. Every piece of data that anyone could possibly present shows that more diverse teams are more innovative. And I don't know where innovation is more important than in our tech sector. Our last thread is about fundraising, because for those that want to take the leap, you'll eventually need outside money to scale. So I bootstrapped my company initially for several years before deciding to raise any capital. And it really was what made sense to me at the time. I was running a profitable arm of the company that was essentially giving me the opportunity to reinvest that capital into building products that were super meaningful. I think there was a point at which we realized we weren't just building products to service our services customers, but we were actually creating industry categories And at that point, it made sense to invest in the go-to-market. And to do that, we really did need to restructure the organization into three separate companies and then raise the capital we needed to make them all successful. And that was the point at which we started to think about raising our first round. So when I initially embarked on fundraising, I knew very little about it, like most early stage founders. And I think what's so intimidating is that you have to figure it all out. You have to figure out you know, how do they think about valuation? What's a term sheet look like? How do you construct your board? Who do you even talk to? How do you even get meetings with investors? It's pretty daunting. And I found that the way to get there was really just to try and have conversations with people and take advice. And you'll get advice from so many different angles. And a lot of times that advice will contradict the advice that you got the day before. And so you kind of have to use a little bit of your gut and balance that with what you learn from having conversations with people that have been through the show before. And essentially, you then do what's best for you because nobody's fundraising journey is exactly the same. And so one thing that I think I learned was that you have to figure out what you think you need and put it out there. Find a partner that gets it and that's as excited about your product or your vision as you are and ensure that they share values with you. Because it's a lot like marriage. When you find an investor, they're probably going to be on your cap table for a really long time. And you'll probably make a lot of hard decisions together. So find somebody that you actually believe you can trust and spend time with and build something with. Brianne Asio, CEO of Seeker, reminded us that there are different fundraising avenues. 
even for underrepresented founders. There are so many funds that are focused on underrepresented founders. Like we have Backstage, Gangels, Stella Angels, Ad Astra Ventures. Like there are so many funds that really believe in underestimated people and not just believe in them, but see them as an untapped potential. Yeah, untapped potential. So we have chances all over the place. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think what's happened in the last year and a half is also sort of leveling of the playing field because I don't know about you, but I was raising my series B from sitting at home and, you know, I didn't meet any of my investors in person during the whole process. It was all through zoom from Austin, Texas. And my newest investors that came on board are in Toronto, Canada. And We've never met in person, but we've had a lot of time working through all of the details over Zoom. And what I think is really fascinating about that is it opens up the doors to any entrepreneur anywhere. And going back to your point about untapped opportunity and untapped just talent, right? It it can be somebody sitting in a remote place in the US or any other country in the world that now has access to global capital. And I think that's a really cool and interesting trend that's come out of what we've been through in the last year and a half. And I loved this education from Cindy on how VCs work. So there's a lot of mystery, especially in kind of younger entrepreneurs around how the VC process works and where VC companies get their money. Could you break that down a little bit for us in just as layman terms as possible? You know, that's a really interesting and important question. And it's not one I actually ever thought about as an entrepreneur. I just assumed VCs had capital and they just wrote checks. And I never thought about where they got their capital. Mm -hmm. And Turns out, I at least did understand that before I launched my own firm, I don't think I truly understood it, or perhaps I wouldn't have. Because as a founder and CEO, I needed one yes from an investor. I needed one group, as you were talking about before, to, to, to believe in me, to believe in my mission, and to be that lead to then not only invest, but perhaps bring one or two other firms in. When you raise a venture capital fund, you might need a dozen of those or more. And they don't introduce you one to another very typically. And so you need a lot of yeses and it's a lot of work. And if you've never done it before and you don't have those contacts and relationships, that is a, is a big undertaking. So there were, there are certain terms in the industry like pre-marketing. I had never heard the word pre-marketing before. And, and people who are VCs will just be laughing if they listen to this podcast. It's like, what? You know, of course, pre-marketing. Well, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you know that you only have one chance to make a first impression. But you also know, based on that first impression, that investor is likely to either say no or move ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they move ahead, they, they're serious. Well, there's a whole concept in someone raising a fund for a firm now that I understand of build relationships. It may take one to two years to build a relationship with a potential investor. They're called limited partner investors, LPs. And they may say to you, God, it was just great meeting you. Everything you do is so interesting. Love your track record. Strategy is is a really good fit with us. We're completely allocated for this year. Let's talk again when you raise your next fund. Let's keep in touch. Let's build a relationship. That's a very different scenario from what you're going to hear from an investor in a startup. And so there's just, there's a great deal to learn about also wanting the right kinds of relationships. Investors who have the wherewithal and the interest to participate in your next fund, which you might raise three years later when you don't yet have returns to write checks back out and return their capital. Seed stage investing, our best investments take 8, 10, even 12 years to go from startup to exit. That's the end of our entrepreneurial themes. I'd just like to leave you with some of the most inspiring moments, moments that ring through my head every week. Here's Brianne Asio again, CEO of Seeker. Entrepreneurship has taught me that I am willing to sacrifice too much to achieve the future that I see. 
And what I've been learning over the past couple of years, and particularly over the past year, as I've been aware of how much I've been sacrificing, is that you don't actually have to sacrifice your happiness or your life or the things that you love and the life that you love to achieve the things that you think you can achieve. I think that my view as a person is that I can achieve anything I want to. Like I can I can do anything I want to do as long as I set my mind to it. And having a high quality of life while I'm also scaling multiple businesses or or a gigantic business is also one of those things that I can choose to be happy doing. I don't it doesn't have to be all sacrifice. So I think that it's this this lesson of my drive and my like determination to achieve success, I also need to have that for my personal life and my personal well-being and my my family. So that's one of the things that I've learned about myself is that I, I have the ability to choose what I want to make happen. I think that's great advice or just kind of insight because balance is really hard to achieve as an entrepreneur. And we do sacrifice a lot, whether we try to balance and try to make room for other things. But I think it's incredible when you can figure out the right balance between your work life and your home life and everything else that you're passionate about and care about. So kudos to you for learning that and like kind of, you know, figuring out a way to make it work. Mm, Thank you. And so another thing that I've realized along this is that, you know, building a business does take sacrifice. I'm not saying like you don't sacrifice because you will sacrifice. It's just the extent to how much. And Neha Sampat, founder of Gen Lead Belong Lab. This is exactly what I was meant to do. I mean, I did not know what I was getting into. I had no idea what it really would be like, but it was the greatest gift I gave myself. Like allowing myself to surprise me was truly a gift. Like it it just, it has given me more, not just career wise, but it's given me the personal growth and development I really needed. Like we talked about finding our voices, right? And how that was such a big struggle for me. That was probably, this has been one of the biggest struggles of my life. And entrepreneurship is what helped me find my voice. Like silence everyone around you, sit in an office, a home office by yourself and figure out how you're going to run a company. Like the only voice you're going to hear is the one coming from inside you. And finally, Komal Dadlani, CEO and co-founder of lab for You. This is going to sound crazy, but for me, entrepreneurship is like a spiritual journey. I, I do believe that you grow as a human being if it, it allows you to, to understand your mistakes, uh, to make mistakes, to grow your relationships with people, with your customers, your users, your employees, your investors, your community, your partners. So I would say it's like a you know spiritual journey. The founder has to grow as quick as the company grows. So it's a lot of personal growth, a lot of spiritual mental growth. And if you don't ground yourself, <laughs> things can get messier. Uh, so for me, it's been you know a lot of personal spiritual growth in this journey. I can totally relate to that, and I I feel like. Now I've been at this for 15 years and oh, wow. it's not easy, but I always like to say if it was easy, anybody would do it. And we're not, we're not anybody. We're, we're doing something very different and special, which is awesome. Thank you for listening to this special Entrepreneurship Month edition of Dream Makers. To all the Dream Makers I've interviewed, thank you for inspiring us. Here's a toast to you. Today, I'm enjoying a glass of Chateau Maquin. St. George from Saint Damion, which is on the right bank of Bordeaux. This is predominantly Merlot based. Cheers to you. To all the listeners out there, I can't wait to learn more about what you have planned. You can reach me, Neha Sampat, on Twitter at Neha SF with your story, comments, or your favorite wake up song, wine, or Dreammaker woman to know. Please also leave a review and subscribe to Dreammakers wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back with a one-on-one interview next month. Until then, keep dreaming big, building up, and being a good human. Cheers.
Thanks so much for listening to the Dream Makers podcast. You can reach out to me, Neha Sabhat, on Twitter at Neha SF, that's N-E-H-A-S-F, with your comments, suggestions, your favorite wake-up song, wine, or Dream Maker woman to know. Please also leave a review and subscribe to Dream Makers wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, keep dreaming big, building up, and being a good human. <laughs>